Welcome to Old Path and our study through the New Testament book of Hebrews. We make it to chapter 12. And uh, the you've probably heard me say this a number of times, but when we get to a, a particular passage in the beginning of a chapter, it's easy for our eyes to be drawn to that as though it's somehow an independent thought or that it was written in chapters over a period of time. But it, it all is a continuing thought. And so um, when we get to chapter 12, remember immediately what is said is right on the heels of the last verse of chapter 11. So when we read this, therefore, in chapter 12, let's remember it is a summation. It's a summary of what's being said there. Now, before we actually look at this, there are a few things that I want to make really, really clear, and I, I know I've done it a number of times, especially because of this book. Uh, but this book is probably as good of an example as I can possibly think of where us understanding who the audience is really makes the rest of the book understandable. But it really helps to teach us what I think is a principle in, in Bible study as a whole, and that is that knowing the audience and making sure that we realize that the arguments, if you will, or the things that are trying to be expressed by the writer are best understood because of who the recipient is and who the writer is, those kind of just observational things. So in this case, first century. This is now people who are very much familiar with what Christianity offers and uh, and the essential parts of it. They know all of these things. I am convinced that these are people who have accepted this and yet are willingly looking at a voluntary abandoning of their faith and their belief in Jesus to go back to the law that no longer can save them. And so the, uh, the writer here goes to great lengths to make sure that they understand that there's a problem with doing so. Here's the problem that we run into so often when we start to read through the scriptures. We think as though the writer was writing with the 21st century Christian in mind. And this book, more than any other that I can think of, is a complete um, um, proof that no such thing is possible. Because again, the readers of this are not simple Gentiles from the 21st century. They are people with a, a background of uh, an understanding of a Jewish mentality and a Jewish um, uh, theology. And they have left that in favor of a belief in Jesus and yet some are wavering. So the, the recipients, very, very important. Now, what's great for us to be able to say is what then can a 21st century church glean from what's being said? So again, there's a, I believe that there's really a danger and it happens so often with Bible teachers that they read a text and immediately launch into an application to the church as though the church was somehow the first recipient. And of course, the 21st century church is clearly not ever the original intended audience. We are secondary at this case. In this case, yeah, we're part of the church and this is being written to people with a church understanding, absolutely. But the things that are that are being faced by them are completely different than ours. Uh, the Gentile church of the 21st century isn't seriously considering going back to elements of the law and thinking that somehow they can put their trust in those things. Now, in this chapter, we're also introduced to something that's by implication but you may have been wondering, if you've been studying through this whole book with us, why is it that these people are considering this? Why is it, what is, what is the external or the outside pressure that's causing them to do this? Or is it something internal? They're just kind of reasoning through these things and they've come to this conclusion. Well, I think that that, that question is very easily, I believe, answered when you start to look at um, this particular chapter. And it seems as though there's a genuine persecution that is coming after these people. And so there is really, even in, the, in this sense, probably something of a physical or a literal nature that it may cost them something in a very material sense, um, even to the point of, of uh, potential violence. And, and that'll, make, that'll be made really kind of, I think, abundantly clear as we kind of work our way through the text. So with all that being said, it is really important that we say, first and foremost, who is the one reading this for the first time? Who was the writer? As much as we can tell, usually we can identify the writer. Here we can't identify the writer, but chances are it's Paul. But be that as it may, this is a very select audience. 
and they're very select arguments to that audience that really have their their whole understanding based upon the Old Testament law that was given through Moses. And so that's why in a systemic way, he's gone through point after point after point of people who were under the law would recognize that there is what they had known before, but in the person of Jesus, you now have the person who is the literal fulfillment of all of the types and is a perfect one at that. So there's no reason to go looking after another. So that we can say is an easy takeaway for us in this. Now, in the last chapter, you have examples of people who are before there was the law of Moses. So it goes back into the deepest parts of the history of mankind. By the time that you get to Cain and Abel and the discussion of them, they're well before Abraham. And so that was before there was a, a people of God known as the children of Israel, the Hebrews, the, the Israelis, the Israelites. Um, before there were any of those things, you have before there was anything known as Abraham, you have Noah mentioned, you have Cain, you have Abel, Enoch. These are all people that predate Abraham. Then you have Abraham that's mentioned, and there is the beginning of the children of Israel coming through his generations, through Ab uh, through Isaac and then uh, through Jacob and then his sons. Then you get to Moses, and then you get to the people of the law, and uh, you have that time even after Moses that's mentioned in there. Kings are mentioned, and uh, a bunch of unnamed people just who had gone through a, a variety of things, some of whom are probably able to be understood as being people who were martyred for the church, or through the church, some 30 years as this is written after the resurrection of Jesus. So all of that is just all of the important, very, very relevant background to this, this book and the arguments that are being presented here. So what we pick up as we look through this, this particular text and as we, you know, kind of piece these things together, let's keep in mind that uh, that last chapter, again, encompasses really the the dealings of, of uh, God with man through the generations from the very beginning, Cain and Abel, the first two sons of, uh, of Adam and Eve. And up to this point, once again, the, the whole argument, if you will, that you had from chapter 11 was look at all these people from our common history, the history of humanity, the history of the children of Israel, the history of those people who are under the law, all the way up to their time. They have these examples of people who were given these promises that God had made, and they operated and they acted by faith, and they trusted the God who had made those promises, yet most all of them never saw it realized, the promise that was made to them. A couple of exceptions, Rahab. She's mentioned here as a person who operated by faith, and she was there, you know, at, at before all of the the the, uh, the calamity that befell Jericho. She was there when the spies showed up. She asked to be preserved from the judgment that was coming upon Jericho, and she survived it. So, what she had trusted in came to a realization. Other ones never actually saw it. So did Abraham actually see all the generations and the multitude of his children being more numerous than the, the sands of the sea or the stars of the sky? Of course not. He never saw that. It was never realized. Not in his time. It was fully realized in time, and the blessing that was promised to him at chapter 12 of Genesis took place in the person of Jesus, through whom the nations would be blessed, that salvation could come to all mankind. So with all of that as the background, when you get to chapter 12 and he says, therefore, let us, that is not saying to the church in the 21st century. Let us means that he once again puts himself and he numbers himself among the people that he's writing to. People who, I have no other way of explaining it, are genuinely courting the idea of going back to something that no longer has the power to save them. And he's trying to warn them of the dangers of this. He's already said at this point, I have better hopes for you. I think that once you consider what you're thinking of doing, once it's all presented to you, you will, you know, kind of move in the opposite direction. That seems to be pretty clear from the text. So anyway, just really fascinating background and understanding that we really should have when we start to look through these kinds of passages, knowing that uh, this is what the, the scripture would, would say to them. And then we get to the point of saying, so then how does that apply to us here in the 21st century. So even though we're not considering going back to the law, 
but we could very easily consider some might even consider going back to the law or going to the law for the first time or going back to their former life or whatever it was that they believed before because this whole thing of Christianity is just causing too much pressure it's too much difficulty you know I'm going to try to do something else so some in the church would argue that's not even a possibility that's fine let them argue that I know I've been through this a number of times especially in this book you know, let people argue that kind of stuff. I'm way past arguing it anymore. It's just not, it's not worth the time. So with all of that being said, um, let's take a look at the 12th chapter. And uh, there are some really compelling things that, that, yeah, again, on the application side of it, it's very, very good information for the 21st century, but making sure that we in context know why these arguments are used towards the people that they're, you know, directed at, and what is the potential of all of this? We want to make sure we're very, very careful, and not just with this book, but anywhere where we study. Let's make sure that we take care of the text to the original intent, uh, intended audience, if that can be determined, and let's not jump to some kind of application until we've exhausted all of the information about the writer and the recipients and the arguments and why are they important, why are they relevant. So again, uh, making arguments about the finer points of the law and the fulfillment of Jesus of those types doesn't mean as much to a 21st century Gentile that they would towards a first century Jewish believer in Jesus as Messiah. So hopefully you're, you're catching all of that. I know it's, it's kind of repetitious, but we're at chapter 12, and this is a very, very good place just to throw that out as a reminder. So chapter 12, verse 1, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you as we come to your word that we can be understanding, and we, you can lead us in understanding, that we can look at what is said here and we can uh, draw these conclusions and these understandings from it. And yeah, we want to be careful as we understand the history of it, and yet would you help us in our application of these truths and ha help us to see why it is important that we know them, that we understand them, and that we, we lay hold of, of what is being said. So we give you all thanks and pray that you would be uh, glorified in the teaching of your word, and that by your Holy Spirit you would make these truths known to us. And we ask all of it in Jesus' name. All right, so chapter 1 says this, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, uh, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So those first two verses are so packed with meaning and information that we should be very, very careful of. Now, this is written, and you can tell in the first few verses, these are people who are very discouraged about something. And the, the point is, keep the eye on the prize. Look at the, look at the long game here. Don't be so caught in the moment, but look at the big picture. So those are just almost cliches, and they really apply to so much about the day-to-day the -day life of the human that not to be looking at any one snapshot in time, but look at the big picture. So how best for us to do that? Now remember, he's building a case here. It, there's no reason for him to say what he says in chapter 12 if he hadn't already put in place everything that you saw there in chapter 11, because that was intended for them to say, look back at this common history that mankind has had, and we especially as Jews the writer and the recipients, that we have as a common history. And let those people and their examples, let those things be an example to the rest of us, because they endured, they went through a number of different things. Many of them were martyred. Many of them had you know, faced all kinds of adversity and difficulty, and yet they were unwavering in their trust of God. And the, and the payment for that was that eventually, whether they saw it or not, they eventually were able to lay hold of what was promised to them. Remember what we read last week, that there were even those who were awaiting a city whose builder and maker was God, that idea that, that uh, there was something better for them than what is on this earth when they died. And when Jesus resurrected and, uh, and freed them from their captivity of being in, in paradise, the bosom of Abraham, whatever you want to call it, they were brought into the very presence of God. And therefore, that promise that they looked for something greater. They realized it. They've had it. They've, they've been there since the day that Jesus resurrected. They've been in that very presence of God. So with all of that said, now that the, the argument 
for the writer here is to say, since we have them as a pattern, now he's going to start to use imagery that we might think is a race, as he puts it here, that we run this race with endurance. And what are the qualifications, or better, what is the preparation for such a thing? How is it that we can make ourselves ready to do exactly as that is? Now, anybody who's ever competed in athletics knows exactly the point that's getting across here, is there, there is preparation that goes into it. And that preparation must be that we, we kind of put aside the things that are encumbrances. And so as an athlete would do, so also the believer must do, get rid of the entanglements and the things that could potentially be a problem and that could really hinder your race. Now, let's deal with the first verse because it's got so much information. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, so all of these examples that I've just given, he adds himself in that, and in the application we can say, here's where the church can say, yeah, circumstances are different, times are different, but the pressures to be a believer and the ease with which we could very, very easily go back to where we came from, that's ever present. It's a very easy thing for people to do because it takes effort to walk with God and to deny yourself. It takes no effort whatsoever to go back to your unsaved life and living for the, the, the demands of the flesh. That's just obvious, right? So he says, now, if that's the case and we're surrounded by this great cloud of witness, then let's do these things. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And in addition to that, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So again, these, these, these pictures that are there, there's a race that he likens the, the Christian walk to. And anybody who's going to run a race, and he uses, Paul uses this imagery a lot, which is probably a good, another good indication as to why Paul would, would uh, be the writer of this, because he uses similar types of things. Nobody that runs a race is going to, to run without some kind of certainty. People that, that you know, fight, people that compete, they don't do so without really kind of understanding and counting the cost. They engage in these things. They train for it. They, they purpose their mind towards that, recognizing what, what is there. So, again, if you're running a race, though, a particular discipline within sports, you realize that the tape is there. There is a finish line to it, and that's your focus. You're not looking here. You're not looking there. You're not looking down. You're not looking up. You're looking at the end. You're looking at the finish line. So this is the image that, that he's trying to put into their minds. But think about... A person, <laughs> and again, you can get this, this thing in your mind. As we've watched over the years, the people who race and uh, the, the, the world-class athletes, the ones that are running like the, the, uh, the 40, the 100, all those different ones, you see that they are, they are wearing more and more tight-fitting kinds of clothes because they're trying to get anything that would hold them back. They're not restrictive clothing. So you don't see people out running races in robes, you know, long pants. They're not running and they're not running in dress shoes. They're running in things that are intended to make them as proficient as they can possibly be in their race. So the same imagery is here. If a person is going to run a race, they're going to do anything that would that they could to remove anything that would slow them down or impede their performance, right? Obvious. This doesn't take a lot of imagination. So in this case, it's a race that he's being talking about here, but it's a spiritual matter. So of course, that's when he starts to talk about the weights and the sin. Now, the weight is anything that would be, again, an encumbrance. What is it that could possibly be an obstacle to you from operating at your capacity, at your most efficient? So whatever that is, lay that aside. Now, when he says, and the sin, interesting that he, he uses the, the, the definite article. Now, the sin that's been identified, the only one that's really been identified here is the one of unbelief. So if this is likened to a race, and again, we know the, the rest, we've got the 11 chapters before this, the 10 in particular that deal with the law and Jesus being so much greater than those things, greater than angels, greater, greater than any of the types. So if he's greater than all of those things, then the one sin that could trip them up above every other one and then that would really create a, a, a real desperate eternal kind of a problem is that one of unbelief. Now, not everybody is in, in agreement on this. They could say that there's a definite article, but it doesn't, it lacks um, a, a specific example. So it might be the sin that trips up any one particular person and not all of them as one. But again, the context seems to be 
so much better for us to to stay with the one sin that that would disqualify a person from a race. So again, using that imagery, we know that there are things that you can do that will disqualify you in a race. Things that happen at the start, you can you can disqualify yourself by leaving the the uh, uh, leaving the mark too early, or things that you may do during the course of the race. The longer ones are more like this, where you could. You know, you could kick somebody, you could you could push them out of the way, you could do something physically that would make a disqualification for you. If that's the case, what would be the disqualifier for these people? The weights, not putting off what you're supposed to? No, that's just going to impede your progress, and that's going to keep you potentially in your place of infancy, something he's warned about, obviously, before this in verse or chapter 5. But this is more... Get get the things, the obstacles out of your way, but avoid the single sin that is the biggest issue, and it's the repeating theme in this, that being unbelief. So if that's the case, putting aside everything that would be a weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, it's just easy for us to go back. Now, something I want to point out, this sin, it says, which so easily ensnares us. We want to remember that that's one adjective. That's just one word, and it's written out in English that way. But it is the, that that thing that just trips us up. It's so it's so easy for us to fall into that that place of looking at circumstance or whatever else, and start that whole process of just kind of looking the other way. It's so easily it's it's so readily ensnares us, and yet it's so easy for us also to identify what it is and not fall into it in the first place. So it's a it's really interesting wording that's here. But if we stop long enough and just look at the big picture, we could say, gosh, I understand this entirely. Because one, once again, the, I, I would say that the, the thing that we always can, I, I think we can agree on this. The one thing that the devil may want to do trips us up through any one, just, you know, uh, any type of thing. But the discouragement is, why do I bother? At the end of it all, people that would, that would you know, fall into some kind of a sin, and do something that is that is just a weight, something that just ensnares them, as it says. At the end of that whole thing, the frustration that comes with it is, why do I even try? You know, I, I can never do this, and, and God must be so displeased with me. And, and really, at the end of it all, the devil really wants to get us to the point of saying, what's the point to all of this? Why should I bother? Why don't I just give up? It would be easier than having to endure all of this. And that would be the sin of unbelief that leads us away from our dependency and our trust and our, our faith in the finished work of Jesus. So put those things off. Don't be ensnared by them. They're too easy to identify. Keep your eye on the prize, the finish line that is there. So as he continues on, he says, and let us then run with endurance the race that is set before us. That means that you don't quit before you get to the finish line. Run with endurance. It may be a real challenge to you. And from everything that we've read here, the challenges that these people are facing, I've never faced anything like this. This real crisis of do I believe this and will I continue with this? And that there is the threat that may be, uh, you know, being leveled at them that is bringing them to the place of saying, is it really worth it? You're going to see that. He's going to get into that starting at verse 3. Now, how is it best to focus yourself? <clears throat> Again, the finish line. Well, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amazing, all of the imagery and the pictures that are here. Let's look at them uh, uh, and just, we'll, we'll put them all together at the end of this before we move on to verse 3, but let's look at it in the, in the sense that, okay, the finish line, as we've already mentioned from chapter 1, if Jesus stands there, or these witnesses that are mentioned as well, these, these people who are are examples to us, but Jesus in particular, if he is that finish line, if you will, or if he's the really the object of why we endure and we run, he obviously is, it is, ask yourself the question, of all of the things that I know about me and my walk with the Lord and everything else, what is the one thing that really motivates and drives me? I'll see him someday face to face, and he, my Redeemer, will welcome me into his kingdom. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what could possibly motivate you. As a believer, above everything else, that stands alone as the objective. So if that's the case, looking to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher. Now, the author would be the first of a kind. He's the, he's the one who set the trail. He's the one who went first. So 
of everything that we know about our salvation and the means of it, it all had him as the first person to speak about it. So he is the one who goes before in, in all of this. So we think of words like pathfinder and trailblazer and those kinds of words because they were the first ones to ever set a course. They were the first person to ever follow a particular course and set it in place that others could follow. That's the image that's supposed to be here. So he's the one who has gone first. We are the ones who follow. He's the one who has done those. But then he is also, he's not only the, only the author, but he is the finisher. He's the one who's brought it to completion. He, is, he has finished the task and he has perfected that course. So it wasn't aimless. He didn't end before the, the you know, getting to the, the destination. He always knew what the destination would be, set the course, walked it, made it complete, finished it. And so if we think of it in the spiritual sense, Jesus came to earth knowing exactly what he would do. As he went through his ministry, he prepared the people who were walking with him to know what to do afterwards. And then he went and he lived, died, resurrected, and ascended, completing the task. Now all can follow as a result of that. So that's why if this was my last day on the earth and I died today or whatever happened or the rapture happens today, there's no uncertainty of my future. Not because of anything that I've done. The certainty is because he's the forerunner. He's the one who went first. He's the perfecter. Not only is he the author, he's the one who started this whole thing, and he's the one who set the course, but he's also the one who completed that course, and then all who follow after him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, then we run with this endurance that we find from verse 1. Now let's move on. So he says, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, when he says who, this is, this is the writer's way of saying by the way, let me point out what he did to accomplish this. How did he bring it to perfection, the completion, the finisher of our faith, the one who has gone and set everything in place and finished these things and completed them, perfected them. So what did he do in the process? Or is it a way of just saying, by the way, just in case we want to ask about what that was, the process, if you will, he says this, <clears throat> there was a joy that was set before him who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Let's take care of that part first. The cross was the obstacle that was going to be overcome. Sin required an offering. And so that was the obstacle that kept man from God, and there was no way to reconcile it. So Jesus looks at the cross, realizing that's the only possibility. Remember what he said in the garden. If there's another way, if this cup can pass from me, if I don't have to partake of what's about to come, then let it be so, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The objective, the goal for him was to reconcile mankind back to God, and it was going to take his sacrifice to accomplish that. So that was the joy that was set before him. It was a joyous matter to say, I can reconcile man back to God and in, in an eternal sense, pay for the sin of all mankind, those in particular who would come to him, and I believe of their own free will. I'll make the way possible for them. That's the joy for me to reconcile and draw man back into fellowship with God and then make that a permanent situation. That's the joy that's set before him. So he was willing to endure the cross. And then the next part of it says despising the shame. Now, again, is it a shameful thing when a person has to carry his cross, be spat on, mistreated as he was, beaten by the Romans as he was, slapped around by the, the, uh, the Jews before they sent him off to the Romans, the, the mocking and the ridicule and all of the horrible things that were said about him that we don't even have record of, because how many people actually looked upon him with absolute disdain and hatred? Now, that is the shame that would come from doing what he did. And yet, as he views that, because the larger goal I can reconcile mankind back and I will reconcile mankind back. So even the mockery and even the horrible treatment of him, all the rest of those things, he looks down on them and says, they're not even worthy of my consideration because the goal is so much greater than anything that would happen in the meantime that would somehow be an obstacle to me. It's not even an obstacle. So this is just incredible imagery. So if we're supposed to be looking to him we are supposed to also look to his example. So was he insanely mistreated by the very people that are, are there simply because he is their creator? 
Yeah, I mean, try to wrap your mind around that. The one who spoke the universe into existence is allowing his creation to say the most vile, horrible things and do what they do with to him because they have such utter contempt and hatred for him that they do some of the most cruel things imaginable with no conscience of it. And how shameful that would be and how for a normal person that would be, I don't want to be treated this way. I don't want to, you know, they're going to start to consider all of those things that I'm being so horribly mistreated and so horribly, you know, taken. Um, he doesn't even consider that. In fact, he looks at it and says, that's just beneath me to consider it. That is something that is to be despised, rejected, and just not even not even thought of because the joy was so much greater and the accomplishment was so superior to whatever temporal thing that there was, it wasn't even considered. So, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has, past tense, because of all that, he has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Right back to the first few verses of the first chapter. So, <clears throat> when he did what he did, since he's the author and the finisher of our faith, he is now at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of the church, yes, doing all of those things, and yet there's nothing left for him to do, so he has taken his seat rightfully, and the only thing left for him to do is when that time comes, he will come back to this earth. Oh, not to come. Two things are happening. He will come and meet the church in the air and bring us to him. He doesn't come to the earth at the rapture, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. That whole chapter starting at verse 13, nowhere does it tell us that he comes back to the earth. Or John 14, when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I go, I will receive you to myself. When we read Revelation 19, he comes back to the earth and sets up a kingdom. Before that takes place, there are other passages that talks about he receiving us to himself, not on this earth. So, until he has, that's his next thing, is to receive the church. Then the, the he'll be opening the seals that we see there in uh, starting at Revelation 6. And then there is the judgment of the seven years that happens upon the earth. And then he will make his, his appearing to the entire world starting at Revelation 19. So he is at this time at rest, not doing any of those kinds of things where he would leave that position. But that day is coming. So for those two events, those are still future. So now with that, now to the, the recipients of this letter, here's what I want you to do, the writer says. With all of that understanding, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, and since we have all of these things, Jesus, our, our forerunner, the, the author and the finisher, the completer of our faith and what we put in what we put our trust, since we have all of those things, and since we have all of it here assembled before us, let us then look forward as we run this race with endurance. Keep your eye on the prize. Jesus awaits. And looking at him, the author and the completer. So, with all that said, now, you recipients, first century, the, the original intended audience of this letter, now, here's more for you to, to look at. I want you to consider him. Now, this considering is, I want you to compare yourselves. Whatever it is that you're going through, and this is why we know by implication that there were some external pressures against them that were making them even uh, contemplate doing what he's warning them not to do. <clears throat> so with that understanding... I want you to consider him. That is, again, compare. It really genuinely, think about it, it makes him very real to us. When we can say, I know what he had to endure, so whatever it is that I'm facing pales in comparison. So here he says, Now consider him, the one who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and you become discouraged in your souls. So for any person, now again, here's where we can make application to the church today. If ever there's this question about, well, is it really worth it? Why should I endure? I go through so much trouble. There's so much so much expense to me in the personal sense, whether it's material or the, the threat of my life. Is it really all worth it? And then here the writer says, well, compare yourself to Jesus. Have you ever had to do anything near what he's had to do? And yet he wasn't sitting there saying, woe is me. And is it really worth it? Look at the cost of what it takes for me to do all of these things. See, if we can ever get ourselves out of our own heads and thinking somehow that our lives are so miserable and, tr and troublesome, we have two things to consider. Look at other people who have gone before us that have endured things that don't even begin to approach. We, we don't even begin to approach the difficulties they have endured, let alone Jesus, the one who went and did all of those things on our behalf before we were ever born. 
So get your mind and your eyes off of your circumstances. They are very much temporary. What he has done is absolutely eternal. So make sure that your focus is correct and understandable. For consider him, verse 3, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Keep your eye on the prize. See the big picture. Don't get stuck in the minutia and don't have everything right in front of you. Take a look around. Verse 4. You, this is a statement of fact, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. Isn't that obvious? So you've never come to the point where there is that kind of open hostility like he endured, and yet they're they're very much considering maybe even that, that potential. You haven't had to endure the things. You haven't had to bear up under it, and yet Jesus did, and he did so perfectly. He never fell to any of the temptations. So he never had to worry about the weights and the sin that so easily ensnare. He never worried about any of those things. So again, use him as the example. Consider him. You haven't had to endure what he's done. He paid, for, he paid the ultimate price in his life, and there was a reason why he did that. So whatever price we might have to pay in this world pales in comparison to what ends up being the, the, the payment for our faith and our walk with Jesus. Let's be careful about these things. So he says... And you have, this is kind of an indictment, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons, taken from the book of Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the, love lords he ch whom the Lord loves, those he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Well, this is really fascinating if you think about it, because... The writer here is saying, whatever it is that you're enduring, it doesn't tell us what it is. It doesn't tell us the extent of it, or it doesn't tell, if it's, tell us if it's coming at the hands of people. It doesn't tell us any of those kinds of, of details. None of that information is available to us. But he mentions that this is potentially a chastisement, that God is allowing these things for a purpose and for a reason. And, you know, is this one of those things, if, if you're going to play on the fence, if you're going to do these things and maybe entertain the idea of it, then there may be some real-world consequences to it. It would seem more uh, another direction. They're, they're, God allowing this to be a pressure to them is the idea of testing and, and really finding out, is the Lord allowing a chastening to come against you to see if you're really genuinely ones who are, are willing to do whatever and count the cost? Because we do know other places where the text says that. Will a person count the cost? And yeah, it may very well cost you in order to walk with him. But man, when we start to read through the first century, especially like the book of Acts and watch the things that those guys went through, none of those guys wavered. Um, they endured no matter what, and it came at great personal cost. So the same challenge is there to the readers here. You haven't resisted to the idea of bloodshed. You haven't been to that place. Although if it gets there... Is that, is that something that would change your direction? Would you say, well, now it's becoming too expensive in a personal sense to me because now it's starting to be something that, that it's, it's costing me in that, in that sense. So again, that's really incredible challenge that he has here to them. But again, it comes back to them. Are you willing to do this? Is this something that you are willing to endure? So he asks them. And, but he says, verse 5, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise, don't lightly regard the chastening of the Lord. So this is, is it a disciplining thing? Is it a count the cost kind of a thing that's going on here? That seems to be the direction that he's saying these things. Now he says in verse 7, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? True. There are plenty of times that God has to say what you're considering to do is something that is going to require me to intervene in a way. And yeah, it could be a chastening. It could be a punishment. It could be a, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to live up to and deal with the, the circumstances of what's going on with you as far as your life is concerned. It's a big deal. It's very, very important that they understand this. So a very, very in, it's a it's a really super interesting argument that he brings up here, but it is again for them to recognize that it may very well be that God is allowing a very difficult thing to come upon you to get your attention and to keep you in that place of not walking contrary, walking outside of what he wants them to do. So verse 8, 
But if you are without chastening, of which all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and you're not sons. So once again, if, if people are having a problem with this and thinking, why should I endure this and all the rest of it, and he likens it to kind of a chastening, if you're not getting these kind of things, if, if there's not a cost to it in, in, if there's not a cost to you in this, then are you really even as children anyway? You know, if there's no, if there's no adversity, of course there's going to be adversity. And he's going to allow those things to take place. So verse nine tells us, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? Now, father of spirits, people read more into it than they should. We're talking about fleshly fathers that are here. We've had earthly fathers. They're men of, made of, of flesh and blood, just like the rest of us. They're earthly. Now, if we were willing to give them the due respect and honor that was part of them as fathers, then how much more so that we would deal with the father in the spiritual sense, the father who is the governor, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And as a result of that, live, endure. And so it's whatever the cost may be here on earth, it's really of, of no consequence in the eternal sense. Of course, some people have to go through enormous troubles and difficulties and all the rest of it. We get that. But the, the writer here is wanting to make sure if, if, you, if you understand the, the right order of things, we have been willing to be obedient to and even take the correction from, from uh, our fathers here on earth, should we not be so uh, also ready to do so when it's the father who is trying to bring correction to us? So again, is that correction in the form that he's allowing persecution to them? Or is that chastening coming because of their potential wavering? Again, we don't have enough to go on here. It could be both. It could be, you know, it could be some of, of, of each. You know, there's, there's just a lot of ways that this can be viewed because, again, we just don't get a lot of details here from him. So then verse 10 tells us, For they indeed for a few days chastened dust as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Again, a fascinating thing, the idea that we could be partakers of his holiness. Now, that is, again, looking at the long view, that, that being partakers of his holiness means that there's a time when we will leave this corruption and reconcile to him, and that the Bible talks about us as being glorified, as being made perfect. But really, in the big picture, it doesn't take much to realize that if we know that, that in heaven that there is no more corruption, and we're there, then that means that there's no more corruption in us either. So that, that promise to us is that day that we begin to partake of and be a part of his holiness. That's the lack of corruption. He does away with all of it. By doing away with sin, he's qualified us to be there. But once we are there, then there is no more corrupting influence. We can say that we are walking with him holy as he is holy. Not little gods, not endowed with some kind of power beyond you know what, what, uh, what we are just as who we are there. We're not becoming little gods like some would teach us, but we can say that we are absolutely void of the corruption that is part of this existence now. Even for the most devout of believers, we do know this, that we fall short and nobody's perfect in this case. But we are way, way different than those that are unsaved who have no reconciliation. In Jesus, we have exactly what has been promised to us. So we should keep our eyes on that. That's a super important thing that we need to, to come to grips with to understand. So again, that, that promise of holiness. Now, in verse 11, no chastening seems to be joyful in the present or for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So an encouragement to the readers that are here, whatever it is that you're going through, a chastening, he likens it to a chastening that is coming at the hand of God. God would never do something without a reason. God does not chasten. God does not get our attention. God does not allow us to go through things with no reason whatsoever. There is always some kind of an objective to it. There is the, the end of it. Here is the, the perfect objective, if you will. What happens to the people who go through those times of chastening, those times of disciplining, whatever you want to call it, at the hands of the Lord? The intention behind it is not just, you're going to be punished because I'm angry. That's not how God deals with things. 
I'm going to chasten you with the hopes and with the intention that it will change you on a basic level and you'll grow in your understanding of him and you'll grow in your sanctification, your holiness, whatever you want to call it. You're going to be changed over time. And it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So fruit, whenever you see that mentioned, it just means an evidence. A fruit is an evidence. It's, it's the produce. It's what is produced by your walk with him. That's the fruit. And so in this case, it is peaceable and it is righteous. So when the, the reader of this would, would look at this, they would say, in the overall scheme of things, I cannot walk with God. And if they understand his point, I can't walk with God and yet pursue a course that was not laid out for us. The, the law was a time, at a time, that was the course that God had laid out. However, there's a course that's been as we just seen here, Jesus has given us something that is completely different. He's given us a course that leads to him and acknowledging his sacrifice for us, embracing that and accepting him by faith that he will accomplish everything that he had said that he would. Now, he's already done his part. He lived, died, resurrected, ascended. Now the Holy Spirit has been sent to us. Everything has been done to fulfill the promises that he has made to us. The only thing that awaits us is these lives ending or him coming back for the church before that happens. Then everything begins in our, our eternal sense. And again, I hope that we understand this. From the moment that I pass from this life, if again, the lights went out right now and my next moment was in heaven, I'm cleared of all of uh, all of my, my sin. I'm cleared of all of the, uh, the temporary corruption that is part of this life. I go on to perfection instantaneous because there's no way that these bodies and this corruption can inherit the kingdom of God. That's 1 Corinthians 15. So I have that assurance. I have that promise. That's, the, that's what I have as my focus. That, I would say, is a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, I haven't had to endure the things that are being spoken of here just by implication. I haven't had to do any of those things. But there are those times that God has bring, brought correction to me, and there are those times when, yeah, I've run outside of what God would want me to do. And he brings correction. He brings conviction through the Holy Spirit. It leads me to that place of just saying, I acknowledge what I've done as an offense, and I ask for your forgiveness and for your cleansing. What's the result of that? Peaceable fruit shown in righteousness. Righteousness simply meaning acceptable as far as God is concerned. Not that I walk around with my chest puffed out saying, I'm righteous. It's not me to proclaim what is righteous. Righteous is what he proclaims. He's the one who determines what is or who is and who is not righteous because he's the one who qualifies it. And the righteousness for a believer is very simply this. It is his righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus that we put on us. It is it's something that's like a cloak. It's something that we, we adorn ourselves with. That's the, the imagery that Paul gives us in a few different places. So, again... On the other side of any difficulty or any trouble, any trial that we go through, what is on the other side of it when we finally make it through those things? And again, consider the, the recipients here. Paul, or the writer here, would say to them, whatever it is that you're enduring, keep your, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep looking forward. You haven't had to resist to anywhere near what Jesus had to. And he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And these chastisements, these corrections, this disciplining, whatever it is that's going on, it is but for a time. And we've had to endure it with our earthly fathers. How much more so should we endure it with the one who loves us and in the eternal sense has made a way for us to be reconciled to him? And so the end result of it for those people, don't fall back into what can no longer save you. Endure whatever it is here and now. We have plenty of reason to, to soldier on. We have these cloud of witnesses, these people who have gone before us, let's look to them. And then most importantly, that will direct us to look to the person of Jesus. And whatever happens between here and there, when we see him face to face, any of the difficulties that are here are supposed to produce in us this, this truth, the peaceable fruit of righteousness or the fruit of righteousness. So the end result, acceptable, honorable, useful as far as God is concerned, and he's the one who determines that. No matter what it is, anything that challenges us only sharpens, and that's how it's supposed to be. So we'll get on to the second part of this next week, but that first opening part, make sure we understand why it was being said to them as much as we can, because again, some of this is implied. We know that there is something that's going on. We just don't know the details of it. 
And it is to these people who are facing some difficulties and that those difficulties are really getting them to the place where they're questioning whether or not they should endure doing what they're doing because of whatever these difficulties are. And so his point is, don't look back. There's nowhere to go. And so whatever it is that you might have to pay for in this life and whatever it may cost you in this life, no matter what it is, even to the point of bloodshed, keep your eyes on the prize because that's eternal. Everything here is temporal. Let it produce at the end of it all, when you look back after it's all said and done, peaceable fruits of righteousness. This is what is supposed to be produced in each of us. So with that being said, we'll pick up next week. And if I've had anything that I've uh, said in this, uh, in this study that uh, creates any questions or something you want further definition on, contact us through the ministry website at oldpaththeology.net. Love to get those emails um, or just ask a question on the YouTube channel if you watch it through YouTube. And uh, I love the interaction uh, with the people who watch. So we'll pick up with the rest of chapter 12 next week and look forward to sharing that with you. <music>